for your faces. Thanks for hanging in till the bitter end. I like to think they're saving the best till the last, but it'll be a few like that. Um, at any rate, this is a, a fellow named Jacob Lewis Engelhardt. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1847. His family later moved to New York City where young Jake became involved in the lucrative business of whiskey distilling. And after the Civil War, whiskey, and during the Civil War, whiskey consumption in the States was quite high, so it was a, a very lucrative business. In 1857, oil was discovered in Lambton County, about 50 miles west of London. Englehart had relatives that were in the oil refining business in London, and in 1870, excuse me, in 1868, he joined them in the bustling city. Um, it's interesting to note that whiskey uh, distilling and oil refining are similar. You take apply heat to a substance to create another product. In the case of mash or whatever, you make alcohol. In the recorded case of crude oil, back then kerosene was king before the automobiles. So kerosene for lighting was very popular. Uh, and uh, I've got a friend of mine, Gary May, has joined us for this. He's a well esteemed, uh, a greatly esteemed writer about the oil patch. He's written a number of books about the oil industry. In, uh, in Lambton County, and if I make a mistake, Gary, jump in, okay? Thank you. Okay. Engelhart took up residence in the city's best hotel, the Tecumseh House Hotel, which he soon learned was headquarters of the London Tecumseh Baseball Club. At the time, southwestern Ontario was a hotbed of baseball, and teams from Guelph, Woodstock, and London were among the most successful in Canada. The Tecumseh Baseball Club had a particularly strong rivalry with the Guelph Maple Leafs and would eventually replace Guelph as Canadian champions, adding to its roster several American players, thereby mimicking the Maple Leafs, which people in London for the longest time accused the Maple Leafs of being the Foreign Legion because there were so many Americans playing for them. Jake Engelhart became a director of the baseball club despite being so busy with his growing refinery business that he eventually became president he was known to dip into his own pockets to find the money necessary to bring <coughs> top flight players to town, such as early curveballer Fred Goldsmith from New England. In Guelph, a young man, a young businessman named George Sleeman had fallen in love with baseball. He was a brewer. At the time, Guelph was a town of about 8,000, while London was a city of 18,000. Sleeman was a brewer, and his Silver Springs brewery was a growing concern. He fielded a team for the brewery for which he also pitched. Sleeman can be seen in this photo of the Silver Springs brewery team from the early 1870s. Then the tradition of the day, the pitcher usually held the ball. My apologies on that one. Sleeman, um, he fielded a team for which he pitched. Sleeman can be seen in this photo of the Silver Springs Brewery Team from the early 1870s. Silver Creek, excuse me, Brewery Team from the early 1870s. Like Jake Engelhart, he loved the game and absolutely hated losing. Even before Sleeman became president of the Maple Leafs in 1874, the Guelph team was enjoying great success and defeated most comers. <coughs> it rested the coveted Silver Bowl trophy from reigning Canadian champions Woodstock in 1869. This image is from 1870. The Silver Ball Trophy was first held by Woodstock, but during the early 1870s, Guelph successfully defended it as its rival in London grew stronger and stronger with the addition of important players. By 1874, Sleeman's Maple Leafs were reigning Canadian champions, and he began arranging games with touring professional clubs from the United States, and occasionally crossed the border to play American teams, winning a big tournament in Watertown, New York in 1874. As the Tecumseh's grew stronger, they too played touring American professional teams, such as Chicago and St. Louis, and others, often within a day or two of the Americans playing a game with wealth. And uh, it's interesting to note that the the, 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 the biggest draw for each Guelph, each of Guelph and London was the other city, despite American teams coming through. 
And at the time, as I pointed out, London had a population of 18,000, 12 had 8,000. They would attract 10,000 people to the ball game, okay? Before television, before internet. Okay. As the popularity of baseball grew in London, its ball grounds at Victoria Park became inadequate. And at one point, a grandstand collapsed, injuring some fans. Directors at the Tecumseh Club, including Engelhardt, began looking for a permanent home for the club after the 1876 season. Here is an 1875 game against Chicago, one of the last held at the Victoria Park exhibition grounds. London had a brand new park for the Tecumsehs to start the 1877 campaign. <coughs> As a charter member, along with Guelph of the International Association, a professional loop established to compete against the one-year-old National League. Located at the forks of the Thames River, it was just across from downtown London. This is an image from the Canadian Illustrated News that depicts London defeating Guelph that June. London and Guelph were the only Canadian communities in the new professional loop, which was named the International Association. Recognize that. The 1877 Tecumsehs were a powerful team, featuring the arm of young curveballer Frank Goldsmith, whom Engelhardt had helped lure from his home in New Haven, Connecticut, with financial inducements, including gold. Seven teams, including London and Guelph, vied for the inaugural championship pennant of the International Association. London placed among the top teams, faring better than Guelph, which struck. The Allegheny Club of Pittsburgh was the strongest rival for London and held first place most of the season. The Buckeyes were from Columbus, Ohio, and the Live Oaks were from Lynn, Massachusetts. Concerned about high travel costs and a new ban by the league imposed on playing non-league teams by its members, prompted London about high travel costs and a new ban the league imposed on playing non-league teams by its members prompted London to have second thoughts about joining the National League. London wanted to continue its lucrative games against arch rival Guelph, which sometimes had drawn as many as 10,000 spectators, as I said. <coughs> London returned for second campaign in the International Association, but Guelph chose to play in the Canadian League instead. And here you can see among the guests present were Mr. Harry Gorman of the Kempsey Club of London, desirous of having his club enter the league, if possible. I think the first offer was made by the league. London jumped at the opportunity. And then, after learning about the rules, that they wouldn't be able to play Guelph, they had second thoughts. A pivotal game in July of 1878 against Syracuse marked the beginning of the end for the Tecumsehs as a successful professional nine. Allegations of throwing the game for gamblers turned fans away from the team and it struggled to complete the season after releasing its professionals. As the London Advertiser reported, the team had lost the confidence of its supporters, many of whom bet heavily on it and also lost money. At the time, many professional teams succumbed for similar reasons, including, including the Allegheny Club in Pittsburgh. By 1878, Jake Engelhardt was becoming very busy with his refining business. After fires and refineries in London, and because of long-standing odor complaints in that city, he and several other refiners <coughs> relocated to Petrolia, where they amalgamated to form Imperial Oil. Jake no longer had time for baseball, although his rival George Sleeman and Guelph continued with the Maple Leafs. Shortly after the turn of the century, the Middlesex County farm girl uh, Engelhard had married while living in Petrolia, Charlotte Eleanor Minnie Thompson, died. He re relocated to Toronto and donated their mansion, Glenview, along with surrounding property to the town of Petrolia. Their mansion became the Charlotte Eleanor Engelhard Hospital and continues to operate to this day. 
statues of J. Kamini keep an eye on things outside the hospital. Englehart and his wife Minnie were prominent members of Christ Anglican Church in Petroleum, and upon her death, Jake donated a series of church bells to the church in her memory. Here is the plaque inside the front doors of Christ Church and the bells, which I am proud to say I was actually invited to ring. And they're hard to ring, but they're they're beautiful. There's I think 11 of them all together. Each one has a different name: love, hope, charity, faith. mistake on that. A conservative in politics, Englehart was tapped by incoming Ontario Premier James Whitney to become president of the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway, which, previous, which the previous Liberal administration had trouble extending into the far north to help the province exploit newfound mineral riches that had been discovered there. Englehart succeeded admirably, and a grateful citizenry renamed a small community along the line after him. Englehart is not a big place, and it's a, it's a pulp and paper town, which is located in the playground of northern Ontario. This is an older Jake Englehart, the image likely taken in Toronto during his railway days. His death was widely reported in newspapers, which concentrated on his imperial oil and railway accomplishments, along with his phil philanthropy uh, in, in petroleum. There was not a word printed about his significant contribution to baseball in his adopted country. Jake and Minnie are buried in an impressive mausoleum atop a gentle rise in Hillsdale Cemetery, just west of the town of Petroleum. Englehart's bitter rival, George Sleeman, in baseball, bitter rival in baseball, was inducted into the Canadian <coughs> Baseball Hall of Fame in 1999. An argument could be made that Englehart should be also inducted because their rivalry made baseball better, not only in their own community, but across southwestern Ontario, and both their teams attracted attention south of the border with their exploits. Aside from helping to develop Canada's petroleum industry and his role in opening northern Ontario to mining and for settlement, and his generosity to his church and the town of petroleum, Jake Englehart's legacy includes taking the London Tecumseys to the top ranks of professional baseball and leaving behind the world's oldest ballpark, now known as Labatt Park. And uh, I'm going to announce here I will be nominating Jake Englehart for induction into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, hoping he can join Sleeman, George Sleeman another builder of the game, and also the 1877 Tecumseys, which were just inducted in, 19, in 2021. And as they say, for further information and more complete information about uh, J. Uh copies of my book I now, I believe, are sold out, uh, Scott, but you can order them through the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. You can get it online, but you get a much more full story about Jake Engelhardt. So that's my presentation about Jake. Is the, is the Silver Bowl trophy still around somewhere? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. It's it maybe in some attic somewhere. Yeah, I mean, probably. it's yeah. like all these baseball treasures that show up decades or centuries later. Uh, that would be great to be a center shot, a centerpiece of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, wouldn't it, Scott? Sure would be. Down right. Yeah. Yes, Max. Um, it, uh, not that I've ever been tempted to drink a Sleeman's beer, but. Um, <laughs> have they ever marketed the baseball connection at all to your knowledge? No, uh, not that I'm aware of. And Andrew has a very interesting relic of George Sleeman. Could you tell him what you have? At the, well, it's located at the Hall of Fame. Well, if anybody's you know, interested in some of Sleeman's uh, <clears throat> beer dealings, uh, inside the research library at the Hall of Fame, there is a uh, very large piece of furniture oh. that was uh, George Sleeman's desk. Amazing. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't fit it out when Andrew was. You see it. You see it. That's one hunk of furniture. I was tempted to write a, an essay for the sure. BRJ entitled uh, "The Day I Picked Up George Sleeman's Secretary." <laughs> 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 this was. Uh, it's a huge thing, and it was. Uh, he commissioned a uh, 
a cabinet maker from what's the town just north of Aberfour, just south of Aberfour, the other side of the 401. Morristown and Morriston? Uh, Morriston is close to the river. Morriston, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Uh, he he commit, commissioned a cabinet maker from there. And the cabinet maker, knowing it was for Sleeman, at the very top in the center, very subtly carved in as a beer keg. So it's, it's an absolutely magnificent piece of furniture. Stephen. Is Angle Hearts the owner of the team that bought the Fowler place for <coughs> uh, yeah. I was unable to find any involvement that Jake had with baseball in Petrolia. Oh, well, and yeah. there was, Jake did play in Petrolia briefly. Um, but uh, as I understand it, Jake got so busy, his business was just booming. Yeah. And then it was booming, blowing up. And so he moved to Petrolia, and he had his hands full. There were uh, Petrolia in the 18, late 1870s was just, was just going crazy, and the industry was really taking off. Jake was one busy puppy, I'll tell you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, crowds of 10,000 when there was only 26,000 combined. Presumably this was due to the newly available railroad. Absolutely, and there was a four-hour trek from Guelph to London on the railway, and the Real, the trains would be full of fans as well as the players going from one center to the other. It was quite the spectacle. And one of the reporters from uh, Guelph, uh, I, I saw a report in the Mercury, uh, um, talking about coming to London. I guess it was one of his first visits to London for a game between London and Guelph. And he couldn't stop talking about the money changing hands on the streets before the game. And everybody was betting on baseball. And they were crazy. Both cities were crazy about it. And he was remarking about how much money was changing hands. So when in 1878, when the rumors started spreading that Goldsmith had thrown a game and the players were in on it because there was gamblers involved in trying to fix the game, that when people realized that the integrity of the game that they were betting their hard-earned money on and trying to find time to get to games, right? When they found the integrity of the game was in question, they started falling off in terms of uh, following the team. And uh, that's what led to the demise of the Tecumseh system as a major powerhouse. Because people really felt it first. Gary. Uh, Chip, did I hear you say that uh, uh, George Freeman has been inducted into the board? Yes, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about walking to a part of this not because he hasn't had a champion like you? Or uh, like you know, I never call me a champion. Thank you. Um, no. Um, <laughs> uh, Marjorie Lacoste, who had to leave, um, uh, he's been a big chronicler of George Sleeman. Uh, and Sleeman's tenure was much longer in baseball. He, well, he reverted to amateur status in the Canadian League after the International Association years. He was a, uh, a, a driving force in the game. Engelhardt, as far as I know, didn't even play the game, but he just, just caught baseball fever, right? So I, it could be argued that Sleeman was around the game longer, but I don't know if his contribution is that much greater in the, at the end of the day. And, uh, for instance, w where does Wells play ball games now? They don't play in a park that was built, purpose built for the 1877 Gulf Maple Leafs. So that's part, of, I believe that's part of the legacy of, uh, of our man Engelhart. Yeah, Bob. It was I who nominated George Sleeman. Oh, uh, there's the guilty part. For <laughs> induction into our own fame. I was on the selection committee that year. And I remember precisely the mechanics that were going on in the final meeting of who was going in that year and who wasn't. And Sleeman was recommended. He didn't <coughs> at first seem to be getting the approval of the group. And it had to make a last minute pitch, which barely got him in by one vote. What we needed there at that time was you. We should have gone in together. <laughs> I was just a youngster at the time. <laughs> yeah, I know that. It's it's just a word. Like one of the inspectors from the 1800s, they you only know, had nine or ten baseball players on the team. Is that it? Yeah, they had the minimum. They have, might have a spare. That's about it. Yeah. That was it. That was it. Oh yeah, you played. What happened? Somebody got injured. Well, the, the pitcher was the one they would try to have a backup pitcher, but the rest of them were expected to play. Uh, so you know, he got injured. Them. Well, London had a London had until 1870. 1876, they had still at least one uh, London guy on them, and there was a guy that came over from Guelph later. So, but it was primarily American players, so I guess as they needed to, they could have players come up and fill in. It wasn't. Uh, uh, I haven't heard. <laughs> Mike, 
perhaps, who knows, spectators were sometimes pressed in, into being umpires. Right? Uh, just another word about the Sleeman. I think uh, Sleeman's legacy in baseball was far greater than, uh, than Engelhardt's, I think. Engelhardt's legacy in the world was much greater. Engelhardt made a big contribution to life in Ontario and in, in business and opening up tourism and, and philanthropy and all the rest. And Sleeman was a driving force in, in baseball for decades. And Engelhardt's baseball uh, importance was probably largely tied to uh, the origin of Labatt Park. Uh, but beyond that, it doesn't go very far. But I think there's another reason why Engelhardt hasn't been elected, and that's because nobody's nominated him yet. <laughs> well, it'll be uh, deadline December 1st, right, Scott? Yep. I'm doing that as we speak. Uh, uh, it's a it's a work in progress. It's a what was it called? It's it, uh, somebody's working, working, working on it. it. We're, we're, we're working on it. Working. I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, Gary. Not in progress. <laughs> Just wanted to comment about the nine player teams. The 1869 Red Stockings, right, the first avowedly professional team. They toured with ten players. The tenth player was uh, Dick Hurley, a guy from Holmesdale, Pennsylvania, where I was born. Uh, also famous in baseball circles from where uh, Christy Matheson learned the screwball from a uh, pitcher at Homestale when he was before he became professional. And um, Dick Hurley was a 10th player, the change player. He quit the team uh, and uh, because he wasn't playing. And he just is a 10th player. I can't remember if he walked out in the middle of the 1869 season or the 1870 season. But he quit the team because he wasn't playing. Yeah, yeah. It was a different game back then. Uh, and, and he's hardly known. And the, the starting lineup for the 1869-1870 Red Stockings is well known. He is like almost unknown. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, everyone. And, uh,